Hello. Hi. Hey. Hi. Hello. Hi. 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 Just to kind of give you an idea of what we're going to be talking about today, very high level, what is Web3, what, what is an NFT, what are some of these other words mean, why do people care, why do I care, um, also, you know, opening up space for people to ask questions, like um, Jermaine was telling me before we started, he's been asking what is an NFT, or seeing it for two years, and he's like, what the heck is that? So I'm glad that we have him here today so we can try and answer that question and um, hopefully help everybody who's interested in just learning make a decision on if it's something they want to continue learning about or participating in. So next slide, David. I'm going to give you very, uh, very uh, uh, dramatic cues today. <laughs> Works. Uh, what is Web3? I like to describe it as an internet created and owned by you. I will elaborate because that sounds really, you know. <laughs> yeah, so um, let's start with what the heck was Web 2? What was Web 1? Web 1, um, looking around, I think we might all be old enough to remember like Netscape, AOL, Instant Messenger, early internet. Like when we first got online and said, oh, this, this might be a thing for a while. That was Web 1. At, at that time, uh, what we were logging onto, they were all, all the websites, all of the different places you could go, they're hosted on the various servers. The data is owned by a bunch of different people. And it's, it's kind of wide open, wild, wild west where you can participate more easily. Won't dwell so much on Web 1 because it's long gone, but some of the things that we liked about it, we are regaining, um, such as like a, a sense of connecting through technology without somebody owning <laughs> everything that you're doing, um, which leads us right into what was Web 2. Web 2, still a very real thing. We haven't gotten rid of it. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get rid of it, but Web 2 is kind of hallmarked by the, the social media boom. So more specifically, the point in time where you, you have all of these big platforms, like you have Facebook, you have Google, you have your, your Netflix, you have Amazon, most importantly. So right around the time where you start to realize that Facebook and Google and Amazon own the entire internet, that is what we're talking about when we're talking about Web2. We're talking about the hyper centralization of the internet it's no longer an internet that is owned by you you are creating it you're the one making the internet you're the one making amazon and facebook and google their money but they own everything <laughs> not you um they give you so you, you're creating content on instagram but you know people love your content and then they start to follow you. You have an influence now. You can't just monetize the content. Now you need to actually broker a third party deal with a brand or something like that. Web3 allows you to kind of skip that step and just monetize the actual content. So let's say I make a very awesome video of me making buttermilk biscuits, which I, I can do. I am an artisanal baker. Um, and that video goes viral. People find it super entertaining. They just like that video. With Web2, I wouldn't be able to make money off of that video. I would have to get some kind of deal with like King Arthur flower or I, I don't know, some other type of flower. I'm not a very convincing baker right now, if I can only name one. But I would have to broker some kind of deal like that. There's all these parties involved. I don't really have control, yada, yada, yada. Uh, with Web3 applications, I could just simply say, all right, this video, there are now X amount of copies available 
for people who really loved it for them to collect and I can set my own price. Those are kind of some of the basic elements of Web3 in terms of the transactional nature, like you set your own price, you say when it's available, you say what is available, you say where it's available, you say how many of them are available, and you can also see, um, a, you can see a, a forever ledger of who has collected it, who owns it, who has now transferred it or traded it or sold it for perpetuity. <clears throat> that was a lot. So I'm going <laughs> to pause for a bit. Um, what, what makes Web3 even possible? What makes all of, those, all of that stuff possible? Like, how can I see who has bought this thing and who has sold it and when and how much and this and that? Everything uh, on Web3 is backed by a technology called blockchain. The easiest way to explain blockchain is just imagine a very, very wide network of very powerful to not so powerful computers all connected together looking at the exact same bank account statement. <laughs> it shows everyone the exact same information at the exact same time. So if I log on to the blockchain network and you log on to the blockchain network right now, we can both verify the validity of a transaction. We can both see that this account bought this thing at exactly this time for this much. And it's immutable, which means once something is on the blockchain, once something's recorded to that ledger, it cannot be changed. So that, that kind of establishes your inherent trust. How that's different from Web2 is that we don't have access to that information. The various companies that own the servers, like we'll say Amazon Web Services that owns at least a third of the internet, we can't see what's on the back end. So we have to kind of take what they give us at face value um, unless somebody hacks their system, which is also possible. With Web3, I won't say that blockchain is impossible to hack, but the technology is set up into, in, in a way where that is currently not fathomable to, to hack a blockchain. You would essentially need to hack every computer that is participating um, in upholding the blockchain system. And when I say participation, that comes in a few different, few different modes. So for your blockchain, uh, there, there's computers, there's people, you might've heard of miners, like mining cryptocurrency. What they're doing is they have a computer that is um, essentially competing with other computers or groups of computers uh, to solve an algorithm. That algorithm essentially verifies a transaction as true on the blockchain. So. How it looks for us as users is, let's say I send you $50 in cryptocurrency. There has to be a certain amount of verifications of that transaction for it to go through. They happen very quickly, but I send you $50, I get 25 different verifications of that. What that's essentially saying is that 25 different computers or computing parties have verified this is true. Um, so those are your miners. Those are the people that are also sucking up all of the energy, and which is a cause for concern amongst everybody outside of and inside of the Web3 ecosystem. We will touch on that later. Um, another type of participant in blockchain uh, is just you as a person that is either holding a crypt, holding cryptocurrency or NFTs in your actual wallet, which is just a app that's on your phone or your computer or your web browser that you store your digital assets in, that is connected to the blockchain at all times. So at, at any point in time, you can see what is in a miners wallet which is a lot of cryptocurrency because they are 
just pulling it literally out of the digital ground. Um, or I could see what is in your wallet. I could see, oh, this person collected five of this cute little cartoon NFT here. I know what he's into. Um, the the You're probably saying, well, I don't want everybody able to look inside of my bank account, essentially. Well, one of the other layers of Web3 is an aspect of privacy and um, the ability to be anonymous to a degree. So when I say that you can see who sold, who bought, who traded what, what you're actually seeing is their wallet address. That is just a long string of numbers um, that represents this particular application on your phone, computer, or uh, internet browser. You can shorten that to you know, something that is more branded, more representative of you, like who wants to memorize 30 numbers every time they have to send somebody five bucks? Nobody. Um, so there's, there's, there's domains that you can buy that kind of represent your wallet address. For example, mine is futuresurf.eth, something that, something simple like that. Um, but I can choose to actually attach my my real life identity to my wallet address in some cases i have not um but you can choose to do that and there are also systems in place that sometimes require you to do so so you have your you have your blockchain where everything is recorded this is a part of this is the backbone of web3 you have your wallet which is for the average person your entry point to interact with the blockchain and participate in Web3. Where do you get cryptocurrency? Where do you get NFTs? So cryptocurrency, you would essentially be getting from an exchange, just like how you buy stocks. You buy stocks from a stock exchange. There are also intermediary brokers that kind of facilitate that for you. Um, one of the beauties of Web3 is that you do not need those brokers. Um, the point of almost everything in Web3 is to remove the third party that just kind of slows things down or adds their two cents or adds their fee. <laughs> and so you are really paying, you're paying for the thing that you want and any added uh, transaction fees those are fees that go to actually maintaining the network. So let's say I send you $50 again. I'm sending you a lot of money today. <laughs> I send you $50 again. Um, you might notice that there is a thing called uh, gas fee. Your gas fee is basically a transaction fee for interacting with the blockchain. Anytime that you interact with the blockchain, you are going to play gas. You're going to pay gas. There are some exceptions to the rule at times. Those are a little bit more advanced things that I might touch on a little bit later, but 90% of the time you're paying gas and gas, is, it varies. Gas is constantly fluctuating based on how much activity there is on the blockchain at that given moment in time. So for me, I do a lot of stuff in the wee hours of the morning <laughs> so that I can pay cheaper gas. Um, if I were to do something right right now, it's the middle of the day, it could be a lot more expensive, right? But your transaction fee, that gas fee, goes to maintaining the network. So who did I say was previously in charge of kind of upholding the blockchain? Those are your miners. Those are the people that are paying exorbitant uh, electricity bills and they have very powerful computers and just real quick you, you didn't always need a super ultra powerful computer to be a miner it just got that way because people are competing to get the most uh, cryptocurrency so the more powerful your computer the more transactions you can confirm the more crypto that you essentially get um, but yeah the 
gas fee is essentially the mining fee. It goes and is split up amongst the miners or mining pools that have verified the transactions that applied at that given moment. So it's not going to a centralized party. It's not going back to Facebook. It's not going back to Google. Mm -hmm. It's going, you, you're paying for something that you're actively using and you're paying for it to, to, to stay alive. Kind of like using Wikipedia every day and realizing, you know, this has been free my entire life and they have a donation button up here. I think I'm gonna donate except this is kind of just built into every transaction. So, so yeah, you're, you're interacting, you pay your gas and that upholds the platform. Um, this is kind of like the technological backbone of Web3. Um, you have your cryptocurrencies that you get from an exchange, um, like uh, Coinbase is probably one that some of you might have heard of. I, I don't know. I have a pick. I'm going to stay neutral, uh, but I'll just say that there are other options that are not Coinbase. Um, called there's Binance, B I N A N C E. Okay. Uh, there's KuCoin, K U coin. <laughs> um, just, but yeah, you need a place to go buy cryptocurrency. Um, at these different places, there are functions that I mentioned previously or touched on previously that kind of um, address the anonymous aspect of Web3. So in the United States and most other countries around the world, there's two things called KYC and AML. I don't remember what AML stands for because I don't see it that often nine times out of 10, what you will see is KYC. It's know your customer. This is a verification process that requires you by law to actually enter in your personal information to buy a cryptocurrency. Now, depending on when you got into crypto and Web3 and all of that jazz, you might not have had to do that. I did not. But <laughs> uh, depending on, in some platforms, depending on the amount of value that you're working with, there's kind of a threshold where, okay, hey, you, you're, you're trying to move $10,000 this month. Now we're going to, you have to do KYC. So it's more of like a, a convenience thing at that point. The purpose is, the purpose was to, you know, give, governments and financial institutions the ability to help if something like if something happens like you get fished for your for your uh cryptocurrency like somebody basically cons you into sending them something or you accidentally send something to the wrong place and it's just like trapped in the blockchain um that can happen and <laughs> So you have KYC as a means basically for an institution that's not in Web3 to help you. Most, mostly it was for uh, fighting crime and tracking down money laundering, um, drug dealing, stuff like that. I can tell you from experience, I have not encountered uh, much of either of those things in my personal interactions with Web3. Um, just I would say that your potential for getting scammed is exactly the same as it is in Web2. Uh, due to the immutable and like private nature of blockchain, they, they have to basically convince you to give them certain information. So I don't know if everybody's on Instagram, but just using Instagram as an example, we all have like two factor verification and stuff like that. We have our email, we have our password, we have two factor. But yet we notice people keep getting their Instagram hacked. Their Instagram is not getting hacked. 
someone is convincing them to give them the information that they would need to log into their Instagram. And so it's a matter of people conning each other, being very good actors and some people being uh, more gullible than others. So with your cryptocurrency wallet, instead of two-factor authentication, what you have is uh, you have a seed phrase that is a string of randomized words that you should never give to anyone. Um, you should, the safest way to store that is to write it on a piece of paper and put it into a safe where you keep your gold. If you have that, I don't, I'm just saying things. Um, <laughs> um, you have a seed phrase and then you have a recovery phrase. So how those are different, and they're both kind of the same thing, long strings of randomized words. Your seed phrase is the key to your account. If someone has that, they got you. Um, there are, there's your recovery phrase, which is like, okay, I have my wallet on my phone as an application, but let's say I want to log into my wallet from another phone or from, from a computer or something like that. I basically enter in my recovery phrase and that allows me to kind of open up my wallet that would be the same thing as on my phone. So both you don't really want to give out, but they serve slightly different purposes. Now, I will say that, that there, there is with the highly technological nature of all of these things, it is good practice to not connect your wallet to something that you just don't trust. And what I mean by connect your wallet, um, you now Facebook has a monopoly on like signing into things. Well, Google too. That, that's kind of what your wallet does in the Web3 ecosystem. So I go to a website like a cryptocurrency exchange, or I go to a uh, NFT marketplace. It'll ask me to connect to my wallet. Um, you want to do that at sources that you have trust and high confidence in, but people technically can build things <laughs> that if you connect your wallet to it, then they'll have information you don't want them to have. So that would be like the one heightened level of ability for people to cause you harm that doesn't necessarily exist in Web2. Um, other than that, People are just willingly giving their information away every day. And I, I, I shed a small tear each time. Um, so yeah, we've, so <laughs> I got a little bit off track, but I, I felt like it's very important to touch on security as like soon as possible. Um, so your, your exchanges, that's where you buy your cryptocurrencies. Um, that's where you trade fiat of US dollars or whatever other government-based currency um, for something like Ethereum or Bitcoin or Litecoin or whatever your whatever your fancy is at it, right? Um, an NFT marketplace is where you go to buy NFTs. That one wasn't as complicated. All right. So that is kind of the Web3 ecosystem from a technological side. From a more philosophical, philosophical side, you have this buzzword. You have a lot of buzzwords, but the one that you will hear 90,000 times a day is community. Community. Web3 uh, has a certain ethos of this, like community is super important. So you really have a bunch of, you have Web3 is a larger niche community but it's made up of smaller niche communities. So you have one big bubble that contains a bunch of smaller bubbles that are mostly based on your interest. Um, an example would be, we're, we're here talking about music industry stuff, so I'll stay with that example, but like you have people who are, I'll take a project called Music Machines. Their entire niche community is made up of people who are not just musicians, but they have a certain affinity for like hardware synthesizers and moods and 
keyboards and stuff like that. So anybody who actually is putting up money to collect their uh, NFTs from that project mostly has like some kind of attraction to that design. It's just kind of a base example of how they're building it. So they're building a project that speaks to people of a certain niche. And then they have certain things that uh, that community agrees upon as a benefit. So, hey, we're all musicians. We all believe in the arts. We want to support other artists. We want to support ourselves. So by us buying these NFTs, that money is going into a fund that now we as a community use to give grants to artists. And anyone who has bought one of the Music Machine NFTs is uh, basically a voting member in that community. So let's say all of you apply for a grant. We come together and say, well, I really like her. I like her music. I like, I feel like she really needs this and is going to do something awesome with it. So now the money that we've pulled together as a larger community, kind of just group economics is all of what all of the niche communities are doing. Um, next slide, let's see what that says. Okay, so this is, this is, I should have went to this earlier. So <laughs> the technological backbone we covered, but these are some of the different elements that I want to touch on today that are, there, there could be many more bubbles, but I feel like these are the most important for, um, for kind of a introduction. So we get, so crypto, we have NFTs, we have social tokens, and we have DAOs. I'm going to tell you what a DAO is. Um, these pictures are totally random. Um, <laughs> so don't worry. There's, there's no correlation between mass and crypto. There's no correlation between cats and DAOs, except for there's probably a cat DAO somewhere. Um, resist together, I, I don't know. That, that kind of goes with NFTs. Social tokens, that one works. But next slide, we're going to get into the specifics of these. So what is crypto? Digital or virtual currency. Doesn't need a third party. Secure online payments. These are the variant aspects of what makes up cryptocurrency. But really, it's a line of code, just like every single one of the things we're going to talk today. They are different lengths of lines of code. Um, examples of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, we'll stay there because those are like the two major ones. But there are so many, so many others. Um, and crypto, so with Bitcoin and Ethereum, they have their own blockchains. So a blockchain is a network of computers and it has its own currency within it. Then that currency is what you use to interact on that blockchain. So if I am doing things on the Ethereum blockchain, I need Ethereum. I spend Ethereum, I exchange Ethereum. With Bitcoin, it would be the same thing, except for their blockchain is different and is not designed for you to do much more than sending Bitcoin back and forth. But just about every other blockchain um, is designed for you to be able to, for people to build things on top of it and have more of like a holistic ecosystem um, and different storefronts, different marketplaces, what have you. But Essentially, the cryptocurrency that you see is most times also the name of the blockchain. Um, <clears throat> we can go to the next slide. Make sure I'm not rambling all my time away. Okay. So, what is an NFT? This is probably why you're here. This is probably the main thing, huh? <laughs> Uh, NFT is, a, I like to just say, simply put, digital certificate of ownership. So, um, darn it, I don't have a 
I don't have a pen. I was going to do the whole, like, sell me this pen thing. No, sorry. <laughs> I would do that as an example. Um, so this could mean a bunch of different things. It does. But for, for music specifically, right, digital certificate of ownership that I own a, a, a version of this piece of art. So I think one of the main concerns that, or questions that comes up uh, with music is, hey, if I make my song into an NFT and someone buys it, do they own my song? Yes and no. They own a collectible version of your song. I can write things into my NFT that give them additional rights of ownership. Like I could give them the copyright with the NFT. I could give them publishing capabilities, but inherently it does not mean that unless I say it does. And by saying it does, doesn't mean you suddenly have to like learn how to write code to put that in there. There's like a description box. <laughs> There's a description box you fill out and you says, this comes with this. If it doesn't say, if it doesn't say anything in it, you are just collecting this file is all you're doing. Um, now, there's a, a buzzword called utility, and that is what people are referencing when they're saying, like, well, what does it come with? What does it give me access to? Um, so digital certificate of ownership can also be kind of a gateway to other access. Like, maybe you have a website that only people who have this this thing can get into and maybe you put behind the scenes footage on there maybe you put stems for your for your project on there maybe you host a live stream concert and it's only for people who have supported you by collecting this thing that can sound icky to some people here's a version where it kind of makes sense, right? So I want to put on a really awesome show for my fans. Can't afford to, but my fans really want it to happen. Here's a way for me to give them something that is direct, doesn't require a third party, and the funds for that thing help me put on this concert. And then I can make sure that only the people who collected that thing that supported have access through this to this page. Then you might ask, well, why don't I just have everybody PayPal me 20 bucks? Well, there's the aspect of, you know, when artists kind of get big and they're like, I'm gonna give back to my community now. This kind of makes that a little bit more immediate and easy. So you guys all collected my uh, my NFT, we did the concert, and now maybe I say, all right, now that you guys have all actually seen the concert before everybody else, I could I could ask your opinion on this or I could just do it, but it's kind of just better to like bring your people in and say, hey, should we release this to the public? Okay, well, I can now release this. Uh, we've all agreed to release this live video, and now I can say, well, since all of you collected my NFT, I actually have your wallet addresses on record. And when I release this live video as an NFT, I can now enter in everyone's wallet addresses and give everybody a percentage of that for perpetuity. Um, and so what that means, and then also you already own the original thing that you got. And you could choose, now that you've already seen the concept, you could choose to sell that too yourself. So you as the collector, as a fan, you have a thing that brings you into a community, gives you some kind of sense of stakeholdership in a person's career or just as a part of their community. Um, but you can sell that at any time and you can choose how much you sell it for. And when you do that, I, as the original creator, I receive a certain percentage of royalties from that that I've already predetermined when I made it. Um, 
And every single time that it's sold or traded, I get that same percentage of whatever it's sold for. That is kind of an example of how an NFT could work. But you still might ask, well, I mean, I have Spotify. Like, why am I buying an MP3, essentially? It's a very, very valid question. Very valid question. Um, NFTs can also be digital certificates of ownership for physical goods. So maybe I sell an NFT that allow that I also collect like personal information like your name and your address, right? Or maybe I could just collect your email address. Um, that would allow me to do something like, well, uh, everyone who collected my NFT, you actually have given me the number, the necessary amount of funds for me to make a vinyl, which is super expensive. And all of you now get a coupon code that I'm gonna email you so you can redeem this free physical vinyl. Um, but because you all supported me, I was able to make more vinyls. So now I can actually sell the vinyls. Like that's kind of a, this example of how that could work. Um, digital certificate of ownership for physical goods, um, a little bit outside of music, but deed to a house. A deed to a house is a very fragile thing. You can rip it up, you can burn it. Uh, if you are a farmer in Brazil, somebody can just come and take it from you, or they can ignore that you even have it. That certificate of ownership as an NFT is on an immutable ledger, so they can say whatever they want, but there is a undeniable record of that ownership. Um, same thing kind of works with music, except for with music, we have stuff like the copyright office, VMI, ASCAP, very, very big entities that it will take them time and a lot of effort to convert their records onto blockchain. But um, there are other there are other uh, platforms popping up as kind of like, hey, we're going to do what they do, um, like BMI, like tracking your publishing, this and that. We're going to do that for specifically the Web3 ecosystem. So it is still the wild, wild west, but there are these systems popping up almost every day to try and address and give a sense of like familiarity uh, and structure to the music industry. Um, so that you can do more complicated things like tying in your streaming royalties. Do you have a question? Just a quick question. Yeah. It sounds like the NFT is no different than me buying stock in you as a single entity, like a company. If you do well, you get an I A. Do well. You get an A. Yes. It's stock. Yes, it is. It 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 is, and in most use cases that are like present today. That is kind of how it can be viewed. There is use cases where it's not about me, but it's about a shared belief that we have. So like, for example, my personal project um, is all based off of travel. So people that buy, I'm making a passport NFT for the update over time. People that buy that passport um, are essentially funding me to give real real life passports to people who can't afford them. Um, so our shared interest is giving the keys to the world to people and we are all interested in trap. So like, but yes, you're buying stock in a person, an idea, a community, you got it. Thank you, we can go to the next slide. So what is a social token? Social token is a type of cryptocurrency. Um, actually, go back. I'm sorry. <laughs> Before we begin with that, uh, NFT stands for non fungible token. What does that mean in reference to cryptocurrency? Um, so, cryptocurrency is a fungible type of token. So, if you see Ethereum is valued at $2,000, you do not need to buy. $2,000 worth of Ethereum, you can spend $5. And whatever the equivalent portion of that Ethereum is, that is how much you get. So you'll get like 0. 
whatever worth of Ethereum. With an NFT, it's not fungible in that way. So whatever the price is, it's not like the NFT is not divisible. Um, there are applications that people make in in which the, it's kind of like a workaround. So this NFT costs ten thousand dollars. Raise your hand if you got ten thousand dollars. Okay, cool. But collectively, we have it. And so we can do what's called a party bid, where we all put in whatever we can afford, and we try to, as a group, own this thing. The thing is not divisible, but we've pulled together our resources. And then we're when that thing is maybe sold or traded, or and we decide that, we receive uh, royalty percentages that are equivalent to our percentage of contribution to that, that party situation. All right, now we can go to the next one. So social, tech, social token um, is a type of cryptocurrency, but it is basically entirely based on like a person or a group. Um, so let's say you are a really big Anne Hathaway fan. I am a really big Anne Hathaway fan. Let's say that she drops Hathaway coin. I will buy it telling you today, I'll buy it. Um, it doesn't really have any value other than just like Anne Hathaway. Um, <laughs> it's very, very speculative, but essentially I'm just buying a social, I'm buying a currency that now exists only and has value only within her ecosystem. So people do stuff like, it's kind of like rewards points, you know, at Starbucks or something like that. It's like you having your own system for that to reward your community with. Um, depending on how successful you are, the speculative value of that social token can go up. Um, but this is this none of this is financial advice, <laughs> and that is really that's really all there is to social tokens. Um, we can go to the next slide. What is a DAO? DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. You might say, well, yeah, what, what is that though? <laughs> I like to describe it as a book club with a bank account. So DAOs are, it's a, it's not like formally legalized type of business structure, but you could view it as a new structure or way of operating a business or a group organization. Um, so book club with a bank account, we have all agreed that we are into the certain thing. So we all come together as a group, as a community, and we are like, hey, how can we make a collective project together or how can we work together to solve a problem um how this is and and you know we might make an nft together that represents um represents our DAO, and we sell that and then that money goes into our treasury and we decide as a group what we do with those funds but so it's like we all have a vote like I've mentioned this kind of system before, but this is the formalized Web3 version um, that best facilitates that. So you'll have uh, you'll have your 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 token that goes with the DAO. So I'm in a DAO called um, Colors Studio. You know, has anyone heard of Color Studio? It's like it's like a really awesome. So they were. A Web2 um, that started out for their community. So it's a great example. I'll probably touch on it a little bit later. Um, I believe they are in this slide. But I bought I bought a certain amount of tokens at the inception of this DAO so that to help fund the DAO as a community. Um, the DAO also received outside funding from venture capitalist firms or other Web3 communities that were like, hey, I like what you guys are trying to build. We have some money that we can donate to that, right, to build up your initial treasury. So that, and then in combination with what the community, me and some other people have put into it, makes up the initial fund. 
So now we have that, but however amount, just like the party bid situation, whatever the amount of contribution I did kind of directly correlates to how much voting power I have. So I can vote on proposals, but I can also make proposals. Uh, and it's kind of set up to where it's DAOs are set up to provide an opportunity for a group or a business to operate without uh, hierarchical systems. That can sound like chaos <laughs> in some situations. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes that works. Sometimes it is set up to where there is a, kind of a board that you know, we all have like a collective more powerful say by a small percentage than what the community does so that the community doesn't just run wild or somebody with just boatloads of money doesn't come in and buy up all the say. And then now the entire community is kind of like put out from their own thing. So can how much decentralization, how much, you know, hierarchy is kind of like salt, you know, added to taste. Um, but the point is that everyone who is a participant in the DAO has that, 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 that stake, has that say. And it's not all centered around buying your way in. Um, DAOs have that initial funding that they might get from, you know, going to seed rounds or going to venture capitalists and going to just different people and getting initial funding for their idea, they will reward their community participants with tokens. So uh, when Colors Studio started their DAO, a certain amount of people who have been very uh, important in the process leading up to that, who have volunteered their time, who have been very helpful in the community, they've taken up you know certain positions just like because they love doing it and they want to eventually become like an actual founding member of the DAO, they were awarded founding passes or uh, certain amounts of tokens so that they're brought in based off their contributions, not based on how much money that they had. And that's kind of how DAOs function in most cases. But we're here to talk about the music industry. What if a record label was a DAO? So that is a thing. Um, there are a few labels that have converted to this, this functionality. What does that kind of look like? Well, we all like a certain type of music or different types of music, but we, we get together and say, man, I really want to, I just really want to support artists and I really want to have a hand in like finding the next big thing, but I can't do it alone. Um, but I know other people who are similar. So, we pull together, um, we have X amount of money in our bank account, and then we decide, all right, let's find some artists. We find an artist, we, maybe somebody in the community is a, a expert music manager. Maybe somebody is great with music finance, maybe somebody's great with marketing. Okay, you're kind of taking up positions based on your volunteering, uh, based on your experience or what your interest is. And that's your, that becomes your role in the DAO. And so collectively, we are the label. And we all vote and say, OK, um, our A&R guild or wing, they found us five really, really interesting artists. So let's come together and decide what are the things that we can offer to artists. We can offer some funding. We can offer marketing support. We can offer management. How many artists? Can we offer that two at a time? Um, let's say it's just one. We then collectively vote on which artist that is, and we sign that artist to some form of agreement with our record label DAO. And then we release it. Uh, we release the music uh, as NFTs. Maybe we also release it onto Spotify and stuff like that. And the idea is that you, as a label, as a label DAO, you get some of those uh, residual funds that are made by that release that you helped fund and mold. So it's uh, 
it's an opportunity for a label to be, you know, more of a partnership um, amongst regular people and artists than a big conglomerate kind of just saying, you, not you. Um, <laughs> and yeah, there's a part about here not having a central leader or company. You can have that. If you or somebody said, I like the way that DAOs are structured, I like using blockchain tools to kind of facilitate things. I like how it's transparent and things can kind of go a little quickly in terms of transaction speeds. Um, but I still want to own my idea. You can totally do that. I, I own my idea. <laughs> and it's kind of scary to say like, all right, I've attracted all of these strangers and it's like, we agree on some things, but I don't want them to run off with my company and then now it's the thing that I don't like anymore. So, like I said, it's like salt added to taste. Next slide. <clears throat> ah, yes, the uh, questions of how do I start? Like, you threw a lot of words at me, threw a lot of you know, loosely connected ideas. I mean, it's, it's a lot to take in. Where do I start? I like to make it simple. The first thing that you need is to make a wallet. This can be a MetaMask wallet, which that is the one that I recommend. That's MetaMask.io, M-E-T-A-M-A-S-K. Okay, I can read today. Um, it, it has a little uh, fox, little cute little fox insignia. It looks like the Mozilla Firefox thing. Um, MetaMask, the reason I recommend that is because most uh, applications, most places have an integration with MetaMask. Um, Rainbow Wallet and Coinbase as well most places have an integration for them but it's sometimes requires like a small extra step so metamask will give you kind of like the easiest entry point as far as wallets are concerned um step 1.5 if you're ready to kind of like you know jump right in and buy a thing would be to load that wallet with a cryptocurrency which you can do right inside of metamask if you are attending my workshop tomorrow, you'll see how some of these things actually occur in real time. Um, then where do I go? Like, where is Web3 even? Like, <laughs> is it a layer on top of Web2? Is it like next to it? Is it in a different room? Um, nobody knows. Nobody knows. Um, it, is, it is everywhere and nowhere all at once. But the places where I, the places where um, Web3 participants spend their time the most and where the communities are most active are definitely on Twitter. Twitter, very, like number one, if you're trying to get into NFTs and Web3, you're gonna spend a lot of time on Twitter. Um, and Twitter has a uh, a voice conversation chat room type of feature called Twitter Spaces. Um, it is where I'm mostly doing stuff like this, but basically uh, it, it provides easy access for you to join conversations, hear what people in Web3 are actually saying, um, ask questions. Do not be afraid to ask questions. I'll repeat that. Um, but Twitter Spaces is a great place to start. Discord communities. Um, so who who knows what Discord is? Hey, y'all play games. Um, so Discord is kind of like a um, it's like it's like Reddit in a way, but it's like specific to a certain community. So like if we all like blueberry muffins. We join the Blueberry Muffins Discord server, and it's just like one room, just central here. And there's maybe different categories within that, like you know, fresh baked or store bought. You know, those are 
<laughs> and we discuss within that. It's just a kind of an offshoot of the internet. It's kind of like the back alley of social media. So what you'll find is that maybe you are in a Twitter space conversation, you hear somebody talking about a community or a project they're a part of, and you say, wow, that sounds awesome. I want to like be a part of that, or I want to talk to more people in that, that realm that you're in. They'll most often have a Discord channel, and you could join that Discord channel, and then you'll meet all of the other friends, and that is where you can spend time kind of deepening those connections um, with the different people in the communities. The next thing I would say is you can learn a lot from becoming a collector. Um, what I what I realized um, what I realized is that Web three moves very fast in terms of the conversation, but if you're on Twitter, you're now like in it. You're actively seeing it all around you. So when you come across a blog or a newspaper article or a magazine or even an Instagram post that's about Web three or NFTs, a lot of times that information is dated or like we talked about it already four months ago and we moved on or there's a solution. And that's just because the nature of those different types of media outlets, um, they don't lend to real time conversation the way that Twitter or Clubhouse does uh, or Discord. So becoming a collect, but like no matter how much you read, uh, no matter how much you listen in on, there's certain things that will only click for you once you start participating in some way, shape, or form. The more, the least stressful, in my opinion, the least stressful way to participate, like actively, um, you you know, aside from making your own NFT, there's like that. You're now creating a thing. You're now deciding what to sell it for. You're now deciding where to sell it. Like yeah, but if you see a thing that you like, collect it. You will learn a lot just by completing the action. It's kind of like building that, that muscle memory. Um, and also becoming a collector in a lot of cases now makes you kind of, it now signifies that you're a part of this community. And so it's a way that makes it easier for you to meet friends on the internet. Uh, I like to call NFTs new friend technology. I made a lot of friends. Uh, I've also met a lot of those people in real life, and I'm here to tell you about it so they weren't serial killers. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I would say that one. Um, so yeah, becoming a collector is, is a great way to start um, Twitter spaces, Discord communities. What do I do? Listen, take notes like I see so many of you doing. I love this class. Um, ask questions. That it's one of the, it's getting into kind of the more, well, my last slide is about community, but we're getting into like the, the ethos of Web3. It is all about there's a there's a term that is W A G M I, wag me, wag me, whatever. That stands for we're all gonna make it, and that's kind of like the things that we as a community try to preach. Yes, there's some people who don't truly believe that, but the backbone of like what makes a lot of projects successful, aside from like having some kind of hype factor to it, is like their authenticity. Um, them being really, really strong communities of like tight knit communities of people. So if you have a question, like I know you probably have experienced, especially if like you see somebody who's like has 50,000 followers on Instagram, and you're like, they're never going to answer my direct message. They have a blue check by their name. I'm just going to get lost. You are right. <laughs> they're not probably going to answer your message. A lot of those same people have like they're on Twitter and you can send them a message. They'll get back to you like that, because on the Web3 side of things, it's more about like collectively learning together. It's a Web3 is a thing that's not finished yet. We don't know if it'll ever be finished. It's constantly being built, but we're all building it together. So the more that, you know, I take a each one teach one philosophy with it, then if I am I'm exuding that, the people that are receiving that hopefully pay it forward. And so we always talk about mass adaptation. 
well, we want to keep Web3 feeling like it is. And so how we try and get ahead of a bum rush of people who don't care about that is that we take opportunities like this today to sit down with people, teach them what we know, answer questions. So yes, if you have a question, there is no such thing as a dumb question. If somebody treats you dumb for asking a certain question, they are not about community. And I honestly wouldn't really be interested in whatever project they're about to promote. Talk to people one on one. You hear that person that says something, you know, that kind of resonates with you in the Twitter space or something like that. Slide into their direct messages or maybe uh, say, like, hey, would you would you be down for like a one on one call sometime? That one on one call scenario really goes a long way, um, helping you build your community and your network um, and also getting like that better understanding, because like just asking maybe a few different people for their perspective on the same thing you'll start to kind of piece it together most important thing take your time it's still early i know you've probably seen stuff like oh my god somebody made a hundred thousand dollars from their their nft blah, blah 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 it does still happen but you are still early that's not a signifier that you're late that you missed a boat or any of that um i don't know how they came up with this stat but there's something like some people have said it's two thousand I'll say that it's definitely under 10,000 musicians that are like actively selling NFTs. There is billions of musicians on this planet. Uh, so you are just early. For example, I just, I have been into crypto for several years, but I just got into Web3 as an active participant in December. Most of the people that you talk to, most of the people that I talk to, like people who have like founded different apps and this and that, and they're trying to figure out what to do with all these sudden millions of dollars, or like they just got here too. Nobody's an expert, but we're all telling you what we've known based on what like our experience thus far has been. So, uh, I, my this one is definitely an opinion. Opinion, uh, that stems from take your time early and then nobody's an expert. Yeah, some people that'll say, well, I'm an OG. That, that just means that they were there like six months before. <laughs> before. <laughs> so, like, take it with a grain of salt. And you can't be an expert on something that changes, that's constantly changing and growing like that. Um, next slide. All right, so, all right, music industry applications. These are some examples of, of places or uh, different projects that you can kind of check out um, that are using Web3 technologies in different ways. So you have Dequency. Dequency is addressing sync licensing in Web3. So you might say, hey, um, well, what, what does, uh, well, how do I protect or how do I license music for this, uh, this visual work that I made? I want music playing in the background, but it's an NFT and like the existing uh, libraries for music aren't in Web3 yet. So now I have to go through the arduous task of like finding musicians, asking them and coming up with my own agreements and this and that. Now I need a lawyer or or you have people to just steal it because there is nowhere to go. Um, Dequency is stepping in uh, as a platform to kind of provide easy sync licensing for those purposes. So you, they'll have artists on there that have uh, different sounds for you to choose from that you can license and apply to your work, but it's, it's all Web3 based and therefore the royalties are also Web3 based. They're, they're somewhat new, but I'm very excited about their project. Good Karma. Good Karma is a DAO that is a record label. They were who I was referring to with the example earlier. Um, rocking Unicorns. This is a profile picture project. We call that a PFP project. That is what a lot of people see um, outward from the outside looking into Web3. They see like cartoon pictures of alligators and stuff like that. 
bless you, with a, with a bucket hat on and some cool sunglasses. Those are profile picture avatar based projects. They're kind of like the thing that you buy that signifies you're part of this community. Some of them have more actual like use as a community than others. Rocking unicorns is one that where basically the PFP is a signifier of that community, but it also is a thing that they sell to put back into what they're building to give back to their community of artists. So that allowed them to buy land in the metaverse, build a really, really awesome virtual club. And if you're an artist that wants to perform in the metaverse, because, you know, COVID, <laughs> um, you can do so. I have performed there. It is really awesome. It sounds, it's much more fun than it sounds like. If you watch a Twitch stream of a musician, take that, exactly what you're looking at, just put it on a screen that is now inside of a virtual venue. So instead of me as a, a, a viewer, just kind of sitting in a chat room and typing little emotes and stuff like that that are supposed to represent how excited I am, I have an actual character that I kind of designed like a video game. Like you log into whatever game and you create your own player type of thing. Exactly. Yeah, like The Sims. Thank you. I don't play The Sims, so I wouldn't have gotten that one, but yes. Um, just like The Sims, you create your own thing. Now now you're like, it's, it's kind of just like an extra step of, of engagement for both the participant and for the uh, artist. And you could do things like press number six and then your character like makes it rain and stuff like that. They'll like dance around. And that is just a venue in a larger virtual world where there's other venues, other games, and other things you can play. Um, one of my favorite projects. How do you uh, yeah. I'm really interested. So how do you sign up for that? Is that like an NFT exchange? Or how do you, how did you um, sign up to be able to, to perform? Yes, so that's a great question. Um, Rockin' Unicorns, I met them on Twitter. Uh, if you, I'll connect, like I'll, anybody that wants that information, I can like direct you to that Twitter account. But the steps were, I found them on Twitter. They had a Discord. I joined the Discord. And from there, I typed into the general chat, how do I perform? And one of their mods just kind of walked me through the process. They'll probably set up like a one-on-one -on -one call with you, um, walk you over like what the technological needs are. But that was essentially like, I used that exact same webcam right there that you're looking at me with. Um, I used that exact same webcam, put it on my computer, um, I downloaded OBS, which is a free streaming software, and they're gonna give you the, the keys. They're gonna give you a whole tutorial guide of everything that I'm saying right now. But for you, the most important thing I would say is to just write down <laughs> rocking unique horns um, and find their, find their Discord. And of course I can, um, man, I wish that I had like some way, everybody who's viewing um, right now, and here, just write down my, my Twitter. And if you're not on Twitter, write down my email. I'm gonna give you both. So that way, if anybody has any additional questions or wants to connect with anything that I've mentioned here, or even wants these slides, I'll send them all to you. Um, so my Twitter is Cam Murdoch Music, that's C-A-M-M-U-R-D-O-C-H, Music. Uh, it's the same on every social media platform. So if you use a different app, Instagram will work too. Um, and my email is Future Surf Labs. That's F U T U R E S U R F L A B S at gmail.com. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, Colors, Colors Studio, that's the DAO that I, I joined, but they are also kind of like a web to like regular curatorial editorial brand. If you've ever seen those live performance videos where it's like a person just facing sideways, there's a mic dangling and a really pretty okay, just, yeah. yeah. I was wearing a thousand percent like Billie Eilish is a really like 
Yeah. The famous one for them. They yep. them so. Yeah, they have really cool content. Yeah, hers is great. So now they created a DAO that will allow the community to kind of help source that content. Like, hey, I found this artist that's really obscure, but they're really, really awesome. Like, let us, let's write about them, let's talk about them, let's bring them into the community uh, to have a talk with our community. Like, uh, they brought, they, they, like every Wednesday, they bring in somebody really awesome, like Brian, I'm about to throw out just random names, Luna George, they brought in Halik Mall. Um, every week is somebody, uh, and just varying genres. Uh, Music Machines, it's the one I mentioned earlier, uh, about like being interested in synthesizers. What their purpose is, is they create a musician's fund and they give out grants. So uh, you don't have to own one of their profile picture NFTs to receive a grant, um, but having one uh, gives you the extra benefit of like, let's say you have multiple, I could sponsor an artist that doesn't have one and I could say, well, I'm going to sponsor this art. Like having one supposedly increases your chances, but they're, uh, they moved to a new format recently where they're going to be giving out grants more frequently. Um, and so, yeah, an artist wants one and they want to participate in the project at a higher level. I could sponsor that artist and if they receive the grant, then me and that artist are now partners kind of in their project. Like, they're going to do what they do, but I am set to receive a residual royalty of whatever they make from the grant. Um, selection is another like regular what to internet based uh, curatorial brand. They do a lot of festival events. They started off as a radio show, I believe, in the Bay Area. Um, a lot of DJs, a lot of producers like K Trinata, Sango, um, just lots of lots of lots of lots of different like dance music and R and B and just kind of like I don't know how to describe it. It's it's kind of like their own genre at this point. Selection. Um, they moved into Web three and what they a lot of this stuff is very DJ oriented because uh, of the festival. So. They had a very interesting use case for DJs where they got a bunch of their DJs and producers and artists and they made a mix of that. And that's kind of the thing that made them famous in the first place was like every Sunday you just get this two hour long mix of music that you can't find anywhere. <laughs> but they have done the, the awesome digital crate digging for you. And a lot of sometimes it's remixes, sometimes this and that, right? Well, they minted and sold a mix as an NFT, and then everybody who has something to do with any one of those songs got a piece uh, of those residuals. And uh, if you collected it and then you sold it for whatever you wanted to sell your, your copy for, then they get a cut from that too. So they're getting paid perpetually from that DJ mix. Um, and to my knowledge, they're the only people to do that very specific thing. Um, but yeah, these are some different ways Web3 is being used in the music industry. And uh, next slide. <coughs> Community. It's the most annoying and most important word in Web3. Um, I touched on it a lot before, but that's like the thing that I want people to take away from the most is like, yes, yes, we are all in Web3 to make money. Anyone who tells you that they're not, that is a falsehood <laughs> in my opinion. But what like, what I like to say is like, hey, we came for the money, but we stayed for the community. So like I said, I've made so many, so many, so many great connections and friends. Uh, the speed at which Web3 kind of moves conference conversationally uh, allows for uh, allows for those connections to be like to develop and those bonds to be made more quickly. So NFTs, new friend technology, you're building a community. Um, a lot of artists have found uh, have found a place 
for their crazy ideas that just didn't work anywhere else. Um, a lot of artists have found success in fans for the first time. So like in Web3, you're not, um, there's, there's, this community is not centered around like how many likes something has or how many plays it has. Like none of the music platforms even show that information. It's just like, does the art look good? Does it sound good? Do I like the person? Those are the things that kind of drive people to collect. Um, of course, there's like speculative like traders that are like, well, this person has a lot of success and hype. So I think that they're going to go even further. So now I'm investing, but I'm investing for a different reason. Um, yeah, most important thing, we are a community. All right, I'm going to shut up and open it up for questions because we still have time for that. Um, thank you for coming to my TED Talk sponsored by Minnesota Music Summit. Uh, any questions? Any? So, okay. music artists have music. I want to make an NFT. What do I do? You come to my workshop tomorrow. What if I'm performing tomorrow during your workshop? <laughs> Good luck at your show. Um, but also, <laughs> but, but email me. But also, um, to answer that question, if you want to make an NFT, so the steps simplified would be you create your wallet. You have your you have your assets like you have your cover art you have your audio file um then you will need uh some cryptocurrency um i'll just say you'll need some ethereum because that's where most of the stuff is taking place and what that is for is to cover your gas fees for putting your work on the blockchain which is called minting so you're minting your work on the blockchain um how much gas that is, it can vary throughout the day, but also slightly varies based on the platform. Um, I would recommend starting, well, then you would need a marketplace to put it on, right? So I would recommend starting with Zora.co, that's Z-O-R-A dot C-O. And that is because they are I think they're the only, well, not the only, there's like, they're one of like a handful of marketplaces that they don't take a, a transaction fee at all. So whatever you make, like they get zero. Um, most other marketplaces have like a 2.5% kind of like same as credit cards. So, but I'll give you a couple other options. There's also OpenSea.io. Um, there's Rarible. R A R I B L E. There is um, oh wow, I'm sorry, Jazzy. There's Mint Songs. Mint Songs. <laughs> Mint Songs is probably gonna be the um, easiest and most cost efficient. Um, so those other marketplaces that I named, still great. I still love Zora. Um, they develop a lot. Like community said, hey, we need this. They had it like a month later. Um, but Mint Songs is a marketplace that is obviously geared specifically to music. And it's not it's not curated to the point where you have to apply. Like there's music platforms where they're curated because they're still trying to build out the thing. And so if they open the floodgates, it kind of makes it difficult for them to perfect the product. But Mint Songs anybody can get on it um they have a really great support community um you'll most likely be talking to an awesome r d artist named jazzy who's their artist relationship person or nikki their community manager but the reason i recommend them is because their their marketplace is based on uh the polygon chain this is trying to make this not sound super complicated right so you got ethereum that's your blockchain uh but people complain about gas prices right so a company called polygon said hey we're going to build a like a phone case on top of ethereum that makes the gas like zero to nothing it's essentially what it is so mint songs built their marketplace integrating with that phone case so that you don't have to pay a whole bunch of crazy amount of gas and um, they may or may not still be doing this part, but when I mentioned on Mint Songs, they gave me the cryptocurrency that I needed to be able to mint. 
So I mint it for free. So yeah, from there, once you have your assets, once you've chosen a marketplace, once you've connected your wallet to that marketplace, from there, it is almost as simple as uploading a song to SoundCloud. You're just filling out, you're uploading your artwork, you're uploading your file, fill out the name, then you have your description, hey, what does this mean to you? What do you want somebody to get from it? What are you going to give the people that collect it, if anything? Um, and then you'll press the mint button. Uh, your your MetaMask wallet will pop up on the screen. And I'm so sorry I totally didn't say this part because I'm doing a workshop tomorrow. But like your MetaMask, download it on your phone, but also download the Google Chrome browser because the Google Chrome version of it is what you're going to be using most of the time. Like the phone one. You, you're really only using that if I wanted to like say, hey, look at my NFTs, or like I needed to send you something in real in real life. Um, but yeah, it's your Chrome browser. You press the mint button. It'll pop up. It'll open your MetaMask, and it'll ask you to sign this transaction. You will accept, and then you'll wait, and then boom, you have minted a song to the blockchain. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yes. One weird question. Besides being a musician, I'm also a software developer, and you really don't need to stay in data mining. So there must be some money to be made there. What coding languages do you write? Uh, everything from C sharp to Java to PHP to. Oh yeah. And a little bit of Python. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I am not a dev, but I do know that everything you just. Everything you just named, there's use for it. There's a lot of people looking for you. <laughs> okay. um, so like the pride, like I might as an artist have like a, a idea, but I don't know technology, like there's not a protocol or a platform already built that facilitates my idea. Then I need a software developer mm. to write the code. And from talking to devs, a lot of the code um, for simple things like like I just what I just described from her, like doing that on your own website is actually like relatively simple code. Mm -hmm. But I think that also Solidity and Rust are two languages that people um, are mentioning that they like have preference towards, mm -hmm. like for like like platforms that are building like marketplace and stuff like that. But yes, um, data mining. Um, I, like I said, I'm not a dev. I don't know a whole lot, but if I understand what you're what you're saying by that, there's like there's one thing right now that, that as musicians we kind of wire up. Man, I wish I had a thing that scraped data from all of these marketplaces and put it in one place so I could just listen to everything in one place. There's people working on different versions of that. Um, the company that I work for uh, called Doper, they're building a directory that um, does something similar. I don't know if it's going to be like for the purpose of playing like an app type thing, but it's also the beauty of Web3 is that there's we don't want one company that everybody goes to. We want yeah. an ecosystem. Like you remember when you used to go to different stores? <laughs> now you go to one of three. Um, yes. Please, please come to Web3 and yeah. do some some software development. But if you also, um, I don't know if you wrote down my email, if you email me, mm -hmm. I can give you um, very specific communities uh, where you could talk to more people who will know, like, <laughs> know more about what you what you do. Yeah, it almost sounds like when I built a machine, I'll just set in the corner of my room to go mine. <laughs> oh, that kind of data. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, no. You, know, you do those transactions, you know, those algorithms say, go do that. And do I make, and if I get that, does it make a, is it a monetary value for every transaction that yep. verifies? Yes, there is. <laughs> so you get rewarded on um, mining fees for that. I will say that um, mining cryptocurrency has gotten more, it got really competitive. So, like, it just depends on kind of like how. Basically, how many high power graphics cards that you kind of put into your machine, but like you can still do it. 
I don't know how lucrative it is now because you have like companies that are building warehouses of stuff. Um, and that's that's the aspect that like people kind of hate, like as far as energy consumption. But I also say it's like the the blockchains that you can mine, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example, the reason you can mine them is because they're on systems called proof of work. So the proof of work is your computer solving this algorithm and transaction, right? And you get rewarded. Most, well, I won't say most, a lot of the blockchains are either on proof of stake or some other type of system that is less energy intensive but doesn't require mining. Um, and Ethereum, they're actually moving away from that too. So like, to my knowledge, Bitcoin is like really the only one where that's still like a major thing and it's not going to change because they don't want it to. So interesting. Yep. So I don't know too much about cryptocurrency, um, but I think that the magazine from Barnes & Noble kind of were on the first five pages, but I don't, um, could you explain to me I don't like get so um, how there's only like thirty thousand of them, and it's 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 actually zero sum. You know what I mean? That or um, you know what I'm trying to say? Like like with with money, it's 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 not zero sum. You know, like you get some, someone else loses it or something. You know what I'm trying to say? Do you know that about it? Or like how does that work? When you say zero sum, you use you use to like someone else. You lose it. Can you explain yeah. that? Okay. So zero sum would mean like if there are 10, say I take two, if, we, if there are 10 between us and I take two, then you only have eight, you know? So, but if it's if it's not zero sum, like if I make money, you're not losing yours. So that's not zero sum, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I thought I heard that there are only 30,000 Bitcoins available. Do you know that or not? There's, there, so like all of the Bitcoin, there's like a, there's a finite amount of like all the cryptocurrencies and yeah. like it's called mining because your computer is uncovering new Bitcoins as it saw these transactions or like every time a, it reaches a new block in the chain, more Bitcoins are released into the ecosystem. So there is a very specific amount and there's a very specific time in which will reach the point where there are no new Bitcoins. And so it's designed, those cryptocurrencies are designed to mimic like when our dollar was based off of gold. Yeah. So like right now it's not. And so there is, there's no end. You can print as many of the dollars as you want, but with crypto you can't. So it is it is also tied to like the value is also kind of tied to speculation and to fiat currencies um so it's like right now we're in this weird place where like crypto wasn't really meant to be tied to us dollar in such a way it's meant to be like a whole other ecosystem so when people are saying oh wow the price of ethereum is down like it's a bad thing, right? Then you also have other people that are kind of on this side of the fence. Well, one Ethereum still equals one Ethereum. Kind of easy to say that, but like, it's still, we're still in that odd period where like it, we're using US dollars or whatever currency to feed into that system. So um, be a great time for me to reiterate that this is not financial advice. You'll see people make that joke all the time. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, that that's, that's kind of like the gist of like what I know about it. So what you, but there are places where I could, um, I could point you to of people that spend a lot more time on the, the like decentralized finance side of things. And they might be able to answer that question in like better detail for you.